Hello friends, I'm waiting for my uh, phone to set to stop the spinning progress wheel. In the meantime, I know it's actually already recording. <clears throat> hey, welcome back. Uh, my name is Dan Nelson and uh, I'm an artist. Today I'm working on a project that I've been working on for a little while now. Um, doing illustrations for a book. At the moment, I'm over here leaning over to my computer where I want to bring up a picture of a donkey, put it in Facebook so that I can flop it around going the other way. There we go. Okay, so there's a there's a picture of a donkey that will help me just a little bit as I render this donkey over here. So I've called this episode um, Figure Drawing in a Sketchy Style. This is on the way to the finished illustration. I'm doing the illustrations. A lot of background here, and I don't want to repeat it all because I've already said it many times and previous episode. So let me just tell you, I'm working on Bindfong graphics paper, marker paper. It's a translucent paper. Um, I've said this to some of you who have, who have texted me individually, that there is always a, it has to be a cooperative arrangement between the paper you're using, the ink you're using, and the pen. The pen, the ink, and the paper. And of course, in this case, in this kind of pen, you're stuck with whatever ink comes in it, right? But if you're using like a fountain pen like this, that's refillable, okay? So there you go, you, you fill this part up with whatever kind of ink. But uh, that, that would have saved me a lot of frustration as a young man if I had known they have to match with every single job. You have to match the ink, many kinds of ink, right? There's three kinds of ink with the right kind of pen and the right kind of paper. So. I've already done all that work. That's why I'm using Bindfong paper, and this is called an accurate uh, professional waterproof technical pen. It's but it's basically a, a super sharp, super fine point flare sharp uh, felt tip marker. Got it? Super fine point. And uh, let me show you some of the pieces that are finished. I just did this one a few minutes ago. And this is what I want to draw your attention to in this case. So this is a little girl, a, the, hero, the hero of the story, hanging on for dear life to one of the older uh, women in the Bible. Uh, yeah, that's funny. In the story, while they're swinging from a vine. That's funny, Freudian slip there. Here's another one. Um, this is the same little girl at a younger age in history when she hooks a fish hook in this fifth she's five he's 15 she hooks him part of the humor of the story is eventually they get married 10 years 10 years later when she's 15 he's 25 um but again anatomy uh all of this stuff i don't necessarily recommend this but all of these drawings are out of my head I didn't, I, did, I didn't look, no, I did, I, by the way, before I started this job, I did, some of you were here, I did a number of studies. I just brought up pictures of little girls on the internet, mostly of girls, because I, I felt like that was a weak point in my, in my anatomical reference, internal reference file. But other than that re, uh, research, everything else is out of my head. Here they are sitting on the, on the, mother's front porch, a couple older brothers, an older sister, each of them and holding two babies. Again, here's the hero of our story named Emma Lou. And uh, all of these figures are out of my head. Again, I don't, I don't recommend drawing out of your head. Uh, here's grandma dancing. Um, then a couple um, structural, this looks like a hobbit house. A little bit coincidental and this i guess i'll show you two more this is how many i've got finished so far this is grumpa 
grandpa, who, uh, and again, our heroine girl is riding on his back, pointing with her stick, which way he's supposed to go. And again, here's the young man who becomes the husband much, much later in the book, running through the woods. Okay, um, let me get back to the job at hand. Because here's one of the things I want to point out. Um, I am... Hi, Bubble Pop. Good to hear from you again. I am moderately good at human anatomy. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not being humble. <laughs> Far be it for me to be humble. <laughs> I'm trying to be accurate and honest. Um, you know, I'm like a thousand times, a million times better than the man on the street. I'm a thousand times better than the, I'm a hundred times better than the average art student. I'm 10 times better than the good art student, just to give it, but, 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 I can't hold a candle to people like on the internet, Proko, P-R-O-K-O, -O, YouTube video. Um, uh, uh, can't hold a candle to um, Andy, um, Andrew, um, in his book. Can't hold a candle to, and these, you've seen this before, here's my favorite books again, to Andrew Loomis. I mean, freaking genius when it comes to anatomy. Just just, just freaking genius. Um, can't hold a candle to him. Can't hold a candle to Ken Ham. Now, part of the reason I'm showing you all these books and making reference is because all of these people, especially this one right here, this book I've drawn, every single, every single drawing in this book I have drawn um, years ago. Yeah, good. Uh, Proko is awesome. And of course, his production quality is nothing like mine. Mine is, you know, I'm doing live video, down and dirty, you know, sound problems like you're getting right now and all that kind of stuff. I, I, I can't even compete. Uh, I don't know how he got there, but good for him. And he's, he's doing a great job. Okay, so I'm, I'm trying to position myself. I can't hold a candle to those guys. I'm a million times better than an average man, a thousand times better than the average artist, a hundred times better than the art student, ten times better than the average good art student. But I'm not that good. But I'm just good enough. Here's how good I am. <laughs> Here's what the point I want to make. Um, because of the style, and I don't know how well you can see this right here, probably not well enough. But when I say, yes, a Cesar Santos too, exactly. When I say I'm tracing, like this is a light table, right? And it's, it's translucent paper. When I say I'm tracing my pencil sketches, oh, no, 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 no. That doesn't mean I'm tracing line for line for line. No, 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 no. Like right now, I'm just about to move this girl's hand back this way approximately, blah, 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 I would say somewhere a little more than an sixteenth of an inch. Not quite an eighth, but more than a sixteenth. Are you with me? And um, here's one of the things I want to point out to you, that if you draw, see there's my finished hand. And let me hold that up so you can see if I can get it lined up real quick so you can see. It. Okay, get it. you see that finished hand? Okay, that is not a perfect hand. What allows me to get away with such imperfection, however, and this is a really important point, what allows me to get away with imperfection in my anatomical drawings, I'm going to use an, ex an art expression, is my hand. I don't mean my physical hand. I mean the way that I make lines. Um, I am, I am making my lines here again. I don't, you, again, if you can see that, but I just moved that donkey's ear down. See, so I'm not tracing slavishly every time I redraw this. Now, let me look over here at my reference. Okay. Every time I redraw one of these drawings, my goal is to draw it a little bit better than I did the time before, a little bit more accurate. And of course, I could keep going and keep doing more and more and more and more rough sketches. And with each rough sketch, I would get probably slightly more accurate, slightly better. But there comes a time when you have to say, okay, I've got to finish this job. I've got a deadline. I've got a client who's waiting for this job. Um, I've got to make money. I can't spend 14 years on a drawing that's only going to pay me, you know, yay, many hundred dollars. 
So at some point I say, okay, that's good enough. But again, here's the real, the real key is that I'm drawing in such a way that the viewer of the artwork, let me go back to a finished one. Let me go back to one that I, that I kind of like. Either way, I like all of these fine. Let me find one. I just, just did this one just a little while ago. Uh, let me pick another one. Let me pick the one where he's running through the woods. I'm drawing in such a way. Yeah, this is maybe because here he is bare chested. I'm drawing in such a way that the viewer, you guys who are viewing this through fresh eyes, um, the marks, some, some, some art critics, art historians have called this a calligraphic hand. Some, some simply call it the artist's hand. Uh, some call it expressive drawing. I remember, oh, I guess it's downstairs. I have a, a textbook somewhere I, I got in college. Is it here? Guide to Expressive Drawing. Nope, it's down here. It's not, it's not a very great book, but where the marks themselves, just as, just as when we paint, the marks themselves are actually more important than similitude, than realism. Are you getting that? The nature of the marks, the, the, the marks have to be pleasant. Let me draw while I, while I talk. So here I am, I'm going to draw this young man. He's wrestling, as you can see, with this donkey. He is a, but he's a 25 year old, um, you know, mountain man, farmer. Um, so I don't know what your impression of people who, who are lifetime um, agricultural or workers in the earth, but my impression is that uh, most men like that are strong as a horse. <laughs> oh, good question, Julian. How do you stay patient? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Let me try to remember to come back to that. Okay, so um, here he is, young man, strong, strapping young man. Um, and again, I tried to indicate that here. This is a couple years earlier in his life. Okay, so he's got a nice six packs, got some good lats, some, you know, good lats, good buys, good delts, good pecs. All those words we learn when you go to the gym. <laughs> okay. Um, 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 if, if I make my lines pleasant, if, and what I mean by that is the marks themselves, the nature of the marks that I'm making, if the marks themselves are, I'll use a different word, if they're winsome, if they're attractive, if you look at them and go, that is a cool mark, um, then here's what happens. Your brain, your mind, if my marks are pleasant, like for instance, can, can you see, can you see what I did, just did with that guy's pant leg? I mean, it's just a crazy scribble, but it's a pleasant mark. When you look at it, you get the feeling, which is a correct feeling, you get the feeling that the artist, whoever the artist was, in this case, you know, it's me, but if you didn't know who I, if, that, who I am, or if you didn't watch me do it, you would have the feeling that the artist that made those marks was, was the artist was confident, joyful. I don't mean I have to be emotionally joyful. This is important, by the way, even though I am, I'm fine. I'm, I'm in happy, good mood today. There's, you know, the, a, a bad day drawing is better than a good day doing almost everything else or something like that. You know, um, I think there's a golf bumper sticker that says that. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm in a fine mood, but the, 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 the point being, I don't have to be psychologically in a good mood, but my hand has to be in a good mood. My hand has to act as though I'm in a good mood. That's what I mean. So the, the marks that I make are pleasant. They look like they were made by somebody who was confident, so joyful, if I can use that dangerous word, um, and so on. Because if my marks have that feel about them, then the viewer relaxes. I've used this analogy before, and forgive me if you've heard me make it. I'm not sure I've done it on YouTube. I know I've done it. No, I think I have. I know I've done it. Um, 
Boy, that donkey in that picture has a really short tail. I don't think all donkeys have tails that short. Um, I'm sure this this situation arises in um, more areas than just what I'm the analogy I'm using, which is church, <laughs> any kind of amateur gathering where where very often um, non professional musicians get up and sing like a traditional, you know, Mon Pa church. They have special music, right? <laughs> Bubble. <laughs> and um, if somebody gets up in, and I forgive me if I'm, if I, I hope I'm not putting you off by using this quasi religious example, but if somebody gets up in church and they're not a very good singer, you know what happens as soon as they start singing, everybody kind of goes, Unless they're like seven years old, then it's like, oh, isn't that cute? No matter how bad they are. But let's say they're they're not seven. Let's say they're an adult. Um, when when the person starts singing, if they're not very good, uh, attention arises in the room. Okay, and everybody kind of hopes that they'll finish soon. And when they're done, they clap partly because they appreciate the effort and partly because they're glad it's over. <laughs> Forgive me for being too bold and blunt here, but we all know probably whether it's in church or some other social construct, you know, school, school plays, you know, school production. Okay. But when somebody gets up and start, hi, Warren, good to see you. When somebody gets up and starts singing and they're good, and frankly, a little bit of proud papa here right now. I have a daughter like this. When she opens her mouth, <laughs> angels show up. It's like your jaw drops open. You go, oh my goodness, where did that come from? And uh, yeah, she didn't get it from me. Would to God I had her gifting. <laughs> I'm very envious of her gifting. I'm tickled she's got it, but she didn't get it from her mom and I. Um, but when somebody opens their mouth and and they're good, every, my point is everybody in the place goes, oh. And in that relaxed, rested, peaceful state, you are open to whatever the message is that the person is singing through their music. I'm using music as a, an example here. Same thing is true with the lines. If I make pleasant lines, then the viewer, you guys, then the viewer rests, relaxes, goes, oh. And in that relaxed state, and this is important, in that relaxed state, you turn, let me find an example. Here's this guy's left left hand. Okay, see that right there? In if if you look at those lines and say, yeah, those are nice lines, they make you relax, then in that relaxed state, you turn those lines, your brain, your mind turns those lines into correct anatomy, even though my anatomy is only close, close enough, you know, close enough to get the job done. I will say that, but it ain't Andrew Loomis close. It's not Jack Ham close. It's not Cesar Santos or, or uh, Proco close, but what it is, is good enough. And I'm not advocating sloppiness here. Um, I'm just saying in a, one of the ways you accomplish your task as an artist is by number one, creating pleasant marks so that your viewing audience, the people who look at your artwork, and this especially pertains to painting. When they look at your painting, they give you more credit for realism than you actually deserve. Does that make sense? So if, if my marks are nice, and here's the next question. How do you develop nice marks? Whew. Wow. Two things. Of course, practice. You know I'm going to say just do it. But the other thing is, no, it's it's you can actually practice. Yeah, it has to be proper practice. Um, once you discover that some artists have particularly good marks and other artists, eh, so so marks. In fact, I'm should I show you? I guess I will. Hang on just a second. Let me go over here again. I have a, I, this is a, my, a, a, a box of, uh, uh, I want to show you an anatomy book. Um, okay.
Okay, I, I don't want to, I don't hope you can't recognize who this is by. I hope you don't know this person. Very competent, very good anatomy book. I mean, very good. But as good as it is, these drawings, there we go. These drawings aren't, the marks, the lines themselves aren't quite as masterful as, hang on, I'm going to pick Jack Ham. You know, Jack Ham does a lot of funny stuff because he lived in the 60s, so you have to get over his old-fashioned fashion. But um, let me find one where he does some shading. I'm trying to draw a contrast here between truly masterful marks and pretty good marks. So the book I just showed you a minute ago were just pretty good. On the other hand, Jack Ham, even though a lot of this stuff is um, just linear in nature. Okay, there's a good, good. Okay, there's a good example. Okay, my point here is masterful marks, and I don't mean by that realistic. That it's not realistic. It's the marks themselves are pleasant. It looks like they were made by a confident draftsman. Okay, I don't need to show you anymore. And I, I forgive me for showing you one example of somebody who's very good, but their marks aren't quite as good as well. Andrew Loomis would be another example. His marks are outrageous. Let me draw just a little bit more while I talk just a little bit more, and then I'm going to keep this at a short episode. By the way, I'm calling this kind of cross-hatching. Uh, it's not cross-hatching. I'm doing uh, a modified cross-hatching that I am calling scribble-hatching. That's where my, my pen, and you couldn't do this, by the way, with a dip pen or with a fountain pen. This, this kind of marks can only be made with a, a felt-tip pen. where I'm drawing in both directions. Um, when it comes to making masterful, good, interesting marks, there is a king who reigns over us all. <laughs> if I may. I've talked about him before. Uh, his name is Rembrandt. And I wish I had thought about it before I started this broadcast. Um... I would have printed out this this image. Um, um, there's one of his drawings in particular that many artists, art critics in the world, many, some, uh, David, um, oh, what's his name? No, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank. I'll come back to it in a minute. But many artists have said this is the best drawing ever penned by human hand. Of course, that's an exaggeration. I mean, how could you ever say such a thing? But it is such a good drawing. It's a picture, a drawing by Rembrandt. And he has many that would qualify. But it's a drawing by Rembrandt of a group, a small group of people, a little girl helping a toddler to walk, take your first steps. The mother stands in the background and a few other people watch this little infant as he or she struggles toward their first step. And with just that much information, you could Google this yourself. You could Google Rembrandt drawing uh, baby's first steps. That would probably probably bring you to a, a, an image of this drawing that I have in mind. Uh, why, is, why is it so good? And, and as I think as a young person, I didn't realize. And again, I wish, I wish someone had pointed out to me and said, okay, Nelson, you got a life of a art career ahead of you. It would really do you a lot of good if you really zoned in on what is good drawing. Some people think this is the best drawing in the world. Examine it. Find out why. So uh, my goal, not only with the line work, but with what I'm doing now, the shading, is to create pleasant marks. Easier said than done, but it can be done. And uh, I think I'll stop there. I'll, if I find... Um... You know what? I'm going to pause here. I am going to print out that image. I'm going to go look for it on Google, put it, fix it in Photoshop, print it out. But, so I'll be back in just a few minutes. Hey, Bobo, just a few more minutes.
Um, I'm going to catch up here just a little bit. Okay, so here are, I actually printed out two. This is the one that it, David Hockney is the name I was looking for, says, the best drawing ever made. <laughs> now, <laughs> my guess is some of you, when you first look at it, you go, what? <laughs> okay. And by the way, I'm not sure this is the best, it's the best copy I could find. Just Googling Rembrandt, baby's first fat steps. I had to scroll down about three pages to get come to this. I'm not sure that it, it being cropped like this is original. I think it's actually bigger. Um, and, and again, at your first glance, you might go, what are you talking about? But if you examine it for just a few minutes, okay, so here's the toddler. Here's, here's a mother carrying something heavy. That's important that I, I know that's heavy. How do I know it's heavy? Because of the, look at this arm, because of the way her body is shaped because of the way her body is positioned. And how do I know who, how her body is positioned? By a few, just a few very rough scribbly marks. Look at this little girl wearing a dress, looking at the baby, holding the baby's arms. Anyway, I could go on and on and on. Here's the thing. The anatomy is virtually perfect, and yet the economy of stroke is ridiculous. Here's another sketch. Same idea, same idea. Uh, baby a mother with baby on the back a father with toddler on the back and a dog this a whole family walking um the, the the amazing thing is how few strokes rembrandt uses to indicate this scene so if you wonder who i think is good that's who i think is good and i'm not trying to copy him by any means but i am trying to emulate or imitate or be influenced by this notion of economy of stroke uh, just allowing a few marks to convey. Now, of course, I'm doing shading, so that the the by a few marks, I mean the marks, the drawings. Hopefully, stand stand by themselves without the shading, um, and the, the drawings themselves are, I hope, convey accurate anatomy. And again, accurate enough. Let me take this. So again, this is a copy of my pencil sketch. I had to reduce this one slightly. Let me let me show you what I mean. This is my pencil sketch, and it's a little bit too big, so I shrunk it down on my computer. That's the one I copied. Okay, so just that concept. If you can get anything, it's this. Um, learn to make good marks. Develop the skill of making beautiful marks because if you do you don't have to be like anatomically perfect uh, boy and i'm afraid that's sounding like i'm giving you an excuse for sloppiness um well obviously i think that my degree of accuracy in these drawings is accurate enough uh one other quick comment about that um that drawings done like this and this is very typical for like book illustrations. Drawings done um, out of your mind have a certain feeling about them that is sort of fiction like. Does that make sense? It's like they come from a world of their own. Again, I would use a, one of my favorite examples of this would be uh, the famous children's book illustrator Chris Van Allsburg. Um, some of you, in fact, years ago, you might have seen the movie, or two videos, uh, Polar Express and Jumanji. Both of those are movies, full-length movies, based on Chris Van Allsburg's children's books. And in some cases, you might have wondered why some of the images in those movies are sort of strange, like the monkeys tearing up the kitchen in Jumanji, uh, the rhinoceros. They don't look real. They look kind of hmm, funny. Well, the, the reason is because they're imitating the, the makers of that movie. And I'm talking about the old Jumanji, not the new one that just came out a few months ago as I'm speaking right now. Um, the makers of, the, of those movies were, wanted to imitate Chris Van Allsburg's style. And his style was not hyper-realistic. And I think that's what I'm describing here. I want this to be realistic enough to be, so you can relax, you can rest. It's like, oh yeah, the artist knew what he was doing. But I'm obviously using the freedom of a, of a sketchy 
um, let me finish this guy, is, is of a sketchy um, technique um, so that it comes across, th this fits with a book of fiction. The book is fiction. And uh, the alternative to this would be that I take photographs. Well, actually, if I was working as an illustrator for, for what? Uh, let's say for an article about the Olympics, so nonfiction, and I was an illustrator, I would take photographs of a bunch of, a bunch of Olympics. And frankly, I would trace them. Okay, so that's a little different world, and in that world, the, the images are supposed to look much more realistic. But this is a, is a, these are illustrations for a work of fiction. So in my opinion, anyway, the, the, it's appropriate for the illustrations to have a sort of fictitious feel about them. Does that make sense? So they're not, they're not as accurate as, again, like Proko, they're not as accurate as, um, Andrew Loomis, and unless I'm just making excuses for myself, which I don't think I am, I think that that lack of perfect precision is actually appropriate. And of course, the great majority of book illustrators through history evidently agree with me because this is how most books, fiction uh, works have been illustrated. If they're illustrated at all, they're illustrated with, quote unquote, made up or invented illustrations. Okay, that's probably a good place for me to stop right there. Thanks for joining me today. Um, I hope you found that entertaining and especially helpful and informative. Um, I'll be working on this project for many more days, so no doubt I'll be I'll doing, be doing more broadcasts. I have no idea what I'm going to say. I think I just said everything I've got to say. <laughs> never fear. I never run out of things to say. <laughs> I hope you like that, <laughs> and uh, I hope you subscribe, leave a comment, and give me a thumbs up if you like it.